The man behind the curtain is a priest. The curtain obscures the fact that what you're looking at is a religion. And everyone comes away thinking that it's a science. No, it's not. When you pull back the curtain, you're left with religion. And the curtain is called the dialectic. Dialectic is a process of obscuring the fact that you're dealing with a religion. And it's also the process of tricking you into believing in this religion. Now, the Marxists will screech and say that Tick doesn't understand because Karl Marx said in Das Kapital that it's not a religion. They don't believe in gods and they are purely material. But it is a religion. And I don't care what the curtain says. It's a religion and I'm going to prove it. But it's not just Marx, it's Mosley, Mussolini and Hitler as well. They all believe in this religion. And they all use the dialectic to obscure the fact that it is a religion. The dialectic explains why, when you read their books, a lot of the time it sounds really strange. When you're reading Das Kapital or Mein Kampf, you're thinking, why has he written it like that? Why is he not using normal language? And the dialectic explains it. Anyone who believes in the dialectic writes really badly. And the reason why is because... Their objective is not to explain, it's to obscure. They are the curtain that pulls itself in front of the priest. So, in order to explain this, I have to remind you of what this religion is. James Lindsay has once again explained this brilliantly in a series of lectures on YouTube. I will post links to those lectures below. They are by far the best explanations I've seen of this, so I'm going to encourage you to watch them at the end of the video to get another perspective on this. So let's just start from the foundations. The faithful of this religion believe that there is a true God that's not material. It's not physical, it's purely spiritual. It's the absolute idea, or the spirit, or whatever you want to call it. But they also believe that there was a split in the heavens, and from this split you get shards of the true God cast into the ether. The demiurge, the devil, then creates the material realm, this world we inhabit, as a prison for the shards of the true God. So if you think about the Matrix, we're all in this fantasy world that's not real, we just think it is, and Agent Smith, the Demiurge, is trying to prevent us from realising what we are. We are God. We don't know we're God, but if we realise that we are, we will see the code in the Matrix and win. But what this means is that the material world, and every single one of us in it, are shards of the idea, God. And God's purpose, our purpose, is to come back together as one and realise that we are God. In effect, God is trying to remember that he is God. So how do we remember that we are God? Well, the way we do that is through understanding, knowledge, divine gnosis, that God is non-material. He's therefore purely an idea, the idea. So we need knowledge, divine gnosis, of this idea. Hence, the religion is called Gnosticism, or maybe Hermeticism, which is similar. When we realise that we are God, that part is Gnosis, and our pursuit of knowledge will lead us to the idea, so our objective is to acquire knowledge of God, Gnosticism. And how do we gain this knowledge of God? Through the dialectic. The dialectic presents itself as logic, it presents itself as a science, it is neither, it is alchemy, it is magic, it is nonsense. Yet, it's also what some people believe, because it's also a religious faith. When a Marxist says that they're not religious, or that they don't believe in mysticism, then why are they believing in the dialectic? The dialectic is mysticism, the dialectic is a religion. The purpose of the dialectic is to A, obscure that this is a religion, and B, create a heaven on earth so you can become God. That is literally the purpose of the dialectic. So the fact that Marxists believe in the dialectic at all is proof that this is a religion. Marx may have denied it and claimed otherwise, but his actions speak louder than words. The dialectics believe that the unification of God will occur at the end of history. Because once God is created, once all the shards become God again, then there's no need for history. But what is history? History is the study of the human condition via the records of the past. It is not the study of the past itself, it is the study 
of the records of the past, which is not the same thing. But even if it was the study of the past, it's definitely not the study of the future. I know I shouldn't have to state this, but history is not the future. <laughs> and you can't declare an end to history, nor can you use history to predict the future. And yet that's precisely what the dialectics are doing. Theirs is an end of history cult, a doomsday cult. Some technical terms, apocalypticism, a religious belief that the end of the world is imminent, and the word eschaton is the technical term for the end of the world or the end times. Eric Vogelin famously warned everyone not to imminentize the eschaton, meaning don't bring about an acceleration of the end of the world, which is precisely what the dialectics are trying to do. Let's take Marxism as an example. Stalin, in his book Dialectical and Historical Materialism, explains that the purpose of the proletarian party is to take action to destroy the reactionary forces, seize the means of production, and thereby accelerate the process of history. The others have the same idea too, and we'll come back to them a little later. So, the purpose of the process of the dialectic is to get to the end of history and unite as God. That's why, when Marx or anyone else claims that they're not a religion, they're talking out their rears. What they're trying to do is imminentize the eschaton. They're trying to bring about the end of history. I mean, how is that not a religion? They say they're trying to get to a utopia, but then claim it's not a utopia. They say the state will wither away, as they call for more state. Marx claimed it wasn't an ideology, when it's clearly an ideology. It's all complete nonsense. So don't look at what they say, look at what they do. This is a doomsday cult, plain and simple. So, with their intention of getting to the end of history, it's a unite as God, they've decided that the best way to do this is to accelerate the development of society. Now, I would say, okay, if you want society to develop, we therefore need to get rid of the chains of slavery, the chains of feudalism, the chains of taxation, regulation and inflation all of which hinder the development of society. If we're not enslaved, then we would function so much better, and thus progress could be achieved. But that's not what they mean by development of society. Remember, their aim is to get to the end of history. And what does that mean? The end of mankind. They are a doomsday cult, and what they're trying to do is destroy mankind. Communism didn't fail in Cambodia. It succeeded. And the death toll shows that. They want to accelerate the process of the end of history. So they introduce the state police, gulags, mass starvation. These things are part of the process, not a mistake. This is where I disagree with James Lindsay, who said these things were mistakes. But by reading someone like Stalin... <laughs> their intent becomes obvious. Five main types of relations of production are known to history. Primitive communal, slave, feudal, capitalist, and socialist. So we were all frolicking free in the Garden of Eden during primitive communism. Then we had the fall and all became slaves. But we've started to free ourselves, going from slavery to feudalism and feudalism to capitalism. We were, at least up to a point, getting freer. But what's the aim of the communists? To get us back to communism. To send us back to the Garden of Eden. So how are they going to do that? Well, it stands to reason, if we were freeing ourselves as we were going forward through history, then to go back through history, we'd have to do the opposite. We'd have to be enslaved. So first, they'll implement a totalitarian socialist state, then we'll have the rapture, and the state will wither away at the end of history. But of course, mankind will wither away along with it, and the survivors, the priests of the cult, will end up back in primitive communism. They'll end up back in the Garden of Eden and close to God again. It's all nonsense. The, the objective is not to bring about paradise for everyone, it's to bring a return to paradise for the priests only, because 
they know there's only so much room in the Garden of Eden. So the deaths and starvation in the camps are all part of the process of accelerating the destruction of society. In broad outline, the Asiatic, ancient, feudal and modern bourgeois modes of production may be designated as epochs, marking progress in the economic development of society. The bourgeois mode of production is the last antagonistic form of the social process of production. But the productive forces developing within bourgeois society create also the material conditions for a solution of this antagonism. The prehistory of human society, accordingly, closes with this social formation. Let's just put that in plain language, because he doesn't speak normal. He thinks that history hasn't yet started. The prehistory of human society is the current era we are living in now, because we haven't developed the true socialist society. We haven't got to God. So, history hasn't even started yet. It's total nonsense. History is the study of the records of the past. It has nothing to do with the formation of some mystical society. Just imagine how demented a mind you must have to come up with this nonsense. So now we understand their aims, we have to realise that the priests can't do this alone. They must convince people to join the cult before they destroy us all. And how do they do that? They trick them. Now, I've got to explain this. I was a socialist back in the day, but I wasn't a Marxist. I had a keen eye for history and understood that Cambodia, China, and the Soviet Union were bad, and I understood that communism had failed. I had read George Orwell, who is still my favourite fiction author, but I was misled into believing that the workers needed external help to save them from capitalism, and that help would come from the state. So I was a moderate socialist for practical reasons and had never bought into the Marxist ideology. So I never became a dialectic. I wasn't in the cult. Therefore, I can't explain why anyone would fall for this. I'm sure there are reasons why and I'm hopeful that there will be an ex-dialectic somewhere in the comments who can explain to us how they got in it and what it's like to be you know, see the world from the point of view of a dialectic. But I can't explain the trick. All I can do is explain to you the dialectical confusion and take some guesses as to why someone would fall for it. So that's what I'm going to do right now. When humans come across a problem, there are two potential approaches. We can either develop a theory and stubbornly stick to it, adopt a closed mind, and no matter how many times we fail, we just keep doing the same thing over and over again in the hope that we get a different outcome. We call this process insanity. Or there's the open-minded approach. We tried something, we failed, therefore we'll change our theory and try again. We call this process sanity. The dialectics adopt the process of insanity. And no matter how many times their theology goes wrong, They'll not change it, and they'll keep butting their heads against the brick wall, hoping this will create utopia. When normal people have an idea, let's call it a thesis, this goes up against another idea. Let's call it an antithesis. And there can be multiple arguments, multiple theses and antitheses, but eventually, after debate and experimentation, one will be declared the winner. So 2 plus 2 equals 4, or 2 plus 2 equals 5. We have a debate, and it turns out that there is a right and wrong answer. 2 plus 2 is 4, not 5. So the debate is over, there is a correct answer, and this process allows us to get to the objective truth, whatever that truth might be. Dialectics don't believe in this process. They believe that when you have a thesis and antithesis, the solution is to negate the two. They deny both the thesis and the antithesis, and they adopt a synthesis of the two ideas. 2 plus 2 is not 4 or 5, it's 4 and 5. So therefore, 2 plus 2 is 9, or in fact, whatever the priests, the party, says it is. 
it can be four and five at the same time, or it can change. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the truth is gained subjectively. It's not real. It's whatever we imagine it to be. This process of negation, this process of struggle, and the Marxists use that term too, by the way, is the natural order of things as described by the dialectics. Hegel referred to it as Aufheben, destroying something but keeping the essence of the thing so that you can lift it up, revolution, to a higher plane. Marx used the same term in the Communist Manifesto. Abolition, Aufhebung of the family. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. When presented with a contradiction, a normal person would say that there's a problem, or we've obviously got something wrong and we need to rethink it. The dialectic will embrace the contradiction. In fact, they'll say that contradictions are good. They say they're fertile ground for progression. They reject the notion that we should figure out which argument is right and wrong and just synthesize them together so we can find the higher truth. After all, we're trying to become God, right? Now, what I've described so far is more like what Immanuel Kant would think. But Hegel took things to the next level. He said that the world wasn't what our minds perceived it to be, but that the material world is our mind. The reason why is because if we are all shards of the true God, and God is the absolute idea, then the world was created from the mind of God, our mind. And what this does is it justifies the synthesis. We overcome the contradictions, and that's fine because our mind is reality. And apparently these people can hold contradictions in their heads at the same time, which is very strange to me. It's literally insanity. What constitutes dialectical movement is the coexistence of two contradictory sides, their conflict and their fusion into a new category. Formerly, we were in the habit of saying, this is right or wrong. Today, we must put the question accordingly. What would the Führer say? I tell you, if the Führer wishes it, then two times two are five. Yes, when you are a dialectic, right and wrong can no longer be determined. You lose your ability to think, because everything becomes contradictory chaos. So your only guide is the higher synthesis, which is the leader. Be it Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Hitler, Mussolini, Pol Pot, Mosley, it doesn't matter. Your leader, your Führer, is the only one who knows, because the dialectic has destroyed your ability to think. And going back to Hegel, if the world is made from our minds then it stands to reason that the mind is also part of the world. Therefore, both the mind and the world are material. So then, the Marxists come along, want to pretend that they're not a religion, and therefore say they stand for dialectical materialism. They say that the world comes first before the mind. But it's nothing different, because... In their view, the world is material, but the mind makes the material world. And the mind is also material, so it's a circle. <laughs> they call themselves materialists because they believe that the mind is material. It doesn't matter where they start because they end up in the same conclusion. Therefore, they're not dealing with material things. They're dealing with fantasy. They've negated the real and embraced the actual, which is whatever their minds have dreamt up. Hence, socialism is converted from a dream of a better future for humanity into a science. And I know the Marxists will screech and say that Marx said this isn't what he did. He claimed he demystified the dialectic from Hegel. But it doesn't matter what Marx said, it matters what he did. He didn't kick out the priest. All he did was draw the curtain so you can't see the priest behind it. And it's literally in the name. Dialectical materialism. Dialectic, mind, and materialism, reality. <laughs> mind, reality, reality of the mind, it's literally in the name. However, the reason why the Marxists don't view it as mysticism is because they say that the dialectical method moves us from the abstract to the concrete. The reason why is because 
they are going from the spiritual mind to the material realm, which was created by the mind. So they're going from the fantasy to the real, from the idea to the mundane. However, by confirming that they are going from the abstract to the concrete, they're admitting that they've started in the spiritual realm and have gone from that to the corporeal. Therefore, far from being non-mystical, they've brought God down to earth. It's still religion because spirituality is at the heart and soul of it. And Marx took Hegel's historicism and did the same thing, this time using economics as the basis for his study of society. But it went beyond this. The reason they were studying society was so they could discover laws that could be used to predict the future. Marx claimed that they would eventually get to communism. But he could only make this claim because he had supposedly studied the dialectical processes of society, and this gave him the special Gnostic power to say how things will proceed from here on. Now, he got it wrong because he based it all on the now-defunct labour theory of value, but it doesn't matter because millions of Gnostics continue to believe in the lie, and this, to me at least, should be the wake-up call to all dialectics, Marxists and third positionists listening to this. If you cannot predict what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow, then you can't predict the future of humanity. Nobody can predict the future. And the fact that you think you can is an indication that you've fallen into a cult. So it's time to take the red pill. It's time to wake up and get out of the matrix. We live, necessarily, in a society of continual and unending change. Change that can never be precisely charted in advance. But how are they thinking that they can predict the future? Well, what they say is, we have this thesis, antithesis and synthesis, and the synthesis is higher than the other two. This then becomes the next thesis. There is yet another antithesis to this new thesis, and thus another synthesis again. And so, what we're doing is constantly moving higher and higher and higher towards God. Hence the word progressivism, which is progress towards God. Now, it's progress into the land of Looneyville, West Virginia. And so, we can't really call this progression at all. We've got a synthesis after synthesis, in other words, a wrong answer after wrong answer, building up on top of one another in a giant pyramid of stupidity, the state. And what we're left with is one giant stinking pile of dung. Nonetheless, they call this progress. No, it's nonsense. However, this nonsense allows them to say, OK, down the line, this will happen, then this will happen, etc., and it's nothing more than a trick of the mind. It's a blatantly obvious fallacy. It's a trick, it's a trap, snake oil, an illusion. They are trapped in the wizard circle, the Gnostic snake that eats its own tail. Once you're in the circle, it's hard to come out of it. However, going back to the theory, there's two concepts that we need to discuss. One is dialectical materialism, and the other is historical materialism. Dialectical materialism is when the people bring about new social ideas which turn into political ideas. So we form societies, and those societies create the political state. And the purpose of the Marxists is to accelerate the process to bring about the revolution, which takes us to the next step in the chain of progress towards the end of history. Again, the immanentizing the eschaton. Marxist historical materialism says that the chief determining force that changes society is the means of production, which is always a social thing, even though it's not, hence the need to seize it. Men carry on a struggle against nature and utilise nature for the production of material values not in isolation from each other, not as separate individuals, but in common, in groups, in societies. Production, therefore is, at all times and under all conditions, social production. Self-employed people and sole traders don't exist, apparently. And yes, there are flaws in the theory. Anyway, historical materialists also believe that economics drives society and that if we understood economics, we can understand the laws of history, even though such laws do not exist. 
And after studying these laws, we can use them to predict the future. Which is simply another way of saying they're practicing divine revelation. Gnosticism. There are a ton more flaws in the theory, but there's no need to get into them all here. You can pick this apart all day and the dialectics will just resort to calling your name, so it's a pointless endeavour. What matters is that the Marxists, the Fascists and the National Socialists all believe in the dialectic. And this is where Hitler's struggle idea comes from. The struggle is the dialectic. It's the negation of the thesis and antithesis. For the Nazis, just like the Marxists, the world was in constant movement or constant flux as it moves towards the end stage of history. It's this process that Hitler is calling nature. But it's not real nature, it's, it's the nature he's dreamt up in his head. When I did my videos on the Gnosticism of National Socialism, some said that Hitler liked nature, and since nature is the real world, it's not some transcendent entity. Thus, it couldn't be Gnosticism because Gnostics hate reality. But that's a misunderstanding of the word nature in the context of the dialectic, as James Lindsay says. Marxists share your vocabulary, but they don't share your dictionary. In fact, what really drives people towards cults is language, says linguist Amanda Montel. My dad spent his teenage years in the late 60s and early 70s on a remote socialist compound called Synanon that started out as an alternative drug rehabilitation centre but grew to accommodate so-called lifestylers or Americans who wanted in on the blossoming countercultural movement of the time. Children at Synanon were separated from their parents, she says, which is very similar to what Plato suggested in his Republic, which is where the origins of socialism come from. No one was allowed to go to school or work on the outside. At one point, everyone shaved their heads. At another point, couples were split up and reassigned new partners that the leader, Chuck Dedrich, approved of. A very appropriate name for a socialist leader, since most of the priests are rich. The aim of my book is to break down some of these hard and fast linguistic techniques that all of these cultish groups use to manipulate, not just followers of groups like Heaven's Gate, but all of us to some degree. Cultish language works to do three things. The three C's, she says. It converts you, it conditions you, and it coerces you. My parents, they're scientists, and they will use jargon that I don't understand. But that jargon is there to make communication clearer. Cultish language has these ulterior motives, and it's there to make communication hazier. It's there to divide people to shut down independent thinking. And that's how you know that language is cultish, when it causes strong emotional response, but you yourself have trouble translating what it is that you're saying. Questioning, scrutiny, pushback. These are the enemies of any cultish group that wants to remain an unchecked power. So, when anyone tries to express any dissent, you're going to need a roster of these catchy stock phrases in order to shut that person down. Like the word fascist, which is thrown about so loosely that I don't think anyone's not been called a fascist at this point. I would say, if a form of language cues you to have a strong emotional reaction, but causes us to stop asking questions, if it forces you to separate yourself from those who don't know how to use the language, if you find yourself becoming ideologically bound to a set of terminology filled with a sense of elitism just for showing up, those are some cues that you might be involved with a group that's a little too cultish for comfort. This last bit's important because I get dialectics in the comment sections all the time telling me Tick doesn't know, Tick doesn't understand, and never once have they offered an explanation. They pretend that they know Gnosis and act superior to everyone else, as if they're Aryan super saiyans, or species beings, which is what Marx referred to the Aryan socialists as. These dialectics are in the cult. The Marxists, the fascists, and so on are in the cult, and so nobody else can understand them. When I was a socialist, I knew what socialism was. 
But as soon as I lost my faith in socialism, suddenly I don't know what socialism is. Suddenly, socialism isn't state ownership of the means of production, despite the fact that every socialist prior to 1945 said it was. Why? Because now that I'm not in the cult, I can't know. I'm not allowed to know. Because I obviously am not part of the elite. I now don't have gnosis. I must be lying. I must only be claiming to have been a socialist because why would anyone abandon glorious socialism? Oh, and also because I never explained what the dialectic is, that means I don't know what it is. Because obviously, you know, I've not sat here and played my banjo. That means I can't play the banjo. I mean, I can only, only play a couple songs anyway. But obviously, just because I haven't said or done something doesn't mean I haven't said or done it. It's just gatekeeping nonsense. I don't understand why anyone would fall for the dialectic. But I do understand what it is. And the point is, they're using a totally different language to us. And I'm not going to pretend to understand this dialectic language fully, because, as I said in last week's video, I've just discovered that when the Nazis say blood, they actually mean spirit we want to purify the blood, is we want to purify the spirit. Even though I've been studying this for years, it wasn't obvious until I read Peikoff's book. Well, the same thing applies to the word nature. By nature, us normies think Hitler's referring to the real world outside where the animals live. That's not what he means. He's referring to the dialectical method itself. The dialectic dreamt up in people's minds casts its ideas into the material world. Mind makes material, material makes mind. So, when he says nature, he doesn't mean nature, he means the dialectic, which he believes allows him to see the world correctly. Man has discovered in nature the dialectic, the wonderful notion of that almighty being whose law he worships. Fundamentally, in everyone, there is the feeling for this Almighty, which we call God. That is to say, the dominion of natural laws, dialectic laws, throughout the whole universe. Yeah, the dialectic are these natural laws. The dialectic, according to these priests, is behind everything. God is the dialectic. The dialectic is God. For the Marxists, when the dialectic gets them to the end stage of history they will have the new Soviet man, a super being known as the species being, which is what Karl Marx called it. For Hitler, this nature or dialectic is the one determining which race is going to dominate the world. Hence, the folk concept of the world is in profound accord with nature's will, because it restores the free play of the forces which will lead the race through stages of sustained reciprocal education towards a higher type. Until finally the best portion of mankind will possess the earth and will be free to work in every domain all over the world, and even reach spheres that lie outside the earth. And it's not just Marx, and it's not just Hitler. It's Giovanni Gentile, it's Hegel, it's Lenin, it's Stalin, and Mao, and many more Marxist, fascists, and national socialists. It does vary depending on the particular person you're looking at, and their brand of dialectic, but the principle remains the same. And here's the thing. When we look at the traditional political spectrum, you generally have communism on the left and capitalism on the right, supposedly. Obviously, I now reject this, but... Let's just go with it for the purposes of this video. Hitler and Mussolini, the Nazis and the Fascists, do not like either communism or capitalism. They saw these as what? Thesis and antithesis. Therefore, they synthesized them together in a new position. A third position. This is where the idea of the fascist third way comes from. This is where the term third positionism comes from. They didn't pick the name at random, it's dialectical. And here's the deal. If you believe in the dialectic, then the third position is the future. They are the synthesis. The Nazis and the fascists are the synthesis. So if you're a dialectic, and you believe in this nonsense, 
You have to stop being a force of reaction, which is what the Nazis will call you, and get in line with the Nazis and fascists. You have to become a Nazi and fascist if you want to progress towards your end goal. You made your bed, and now you're going to sleep in it. And if you want to know why we have so much racism and genderism on the left, with all this nonsense coming out from them, and why Klaus Schwab is talking about stakeholder capitalism, which is just another name for fascism, the reason why is because they've realised this. Some Marxists have finally realised that their future, according to the dialectical religion that they worship, is third positionism. And so they're embracing it. China has already gone that way. The European Union seems to be moving in that direction too, as does Canada and the United States. They're all embracing fascism or national socialism, but trying to keep it international for now. And the reason why is because of their faith in the dialectical process. Now, what I'm going to do is leave you with a quote about Oswald Mosley, who was the leader of the British Union of Fascists. This quote is coming from a historian who recognises some odd things about Mosley, but he can't explain it because he doesn't know what the dialectic is. I don't expect you to fully understand it either, but you'll certainly see where most of it's coming from. So, here we go. In contrast to Spengler's pessimistic conservatism, Mosley believed fascism could renew European culture in a mutiny against destiny. Caesarism and science would evolve Faustian man and a civilization which renewed its youth in a persisting dynamism, constant movement towards the end stage of history. It would produce a final union of will with thought to a limitless achievement, a reunification of God. Fascism would create a society in which man could become like a god and control like a magician the forces of the universe. In a mystical note, he told Peter Little that after the Caesarist stage, there would be eternal light. Thompson saw fascism as the 20th century expression of the will to infinitude, and Mosley as the leader who would transform the world. For Mosley, fascism would re-spiritualize the thought of the people until the principles of religion returned to their hearts. The militant service and mystical love. Blackshirt Olive Hawks recalled the desire to merge into the greater unit of nation or faith, which derived from fascism's spiritual instinct of self-sacrifice, which set them apart from people who drifted along. Fascism, Mosley preached, comes with the force of a new religion. It was infused with ritual as an alternative to Marxist faith. Its core was the idea of national rebirth, in which the individual would be fused with the mass to overcome oppositions between private and public, individual and collective. Again, a synthesis. It had the totalizing aim of a millenarian cult led by a charismatic leader whose dynamism was recharged in the liturgies of mass meeting where irrational forces of the chosen and the symbolic took over from individualism and rationality. There is a lot in here, obviously, and I hope I haven't lost many of you, and I also hope you're beginning to see why they were doing what they were doing and saying what they were saying. It's not random, it's their dialectical method which was derived from their Gnostic faith. And on that bombshell, here's a bunch of links to James Lindsay's videos on the dialectic. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.